some of the deepest yes. and most enjoyable meditations I have ever done are with your breath hold work practice. Mm -hmm. Because like this morning before, you know, we did, a, you know, what did I do? Five, three minute session, three minute breath holds with you. It was yes. wonderful. And after I'd warmed up, it was a feeling of bliss. Mm -hmm. Like in the middle of the breath hold, not at the end, in the middle of the breath hold, I can remember just feeling bliss. My body felt good. My mind felt good. I felt a real still. I felt a real connection to the world around me. It was, it's such a beautiful place. It is. And I think everyone would like to live in that place or at least experience that place. Yes. And some people will say they can get there through meditation. Yes. And, completely. And it's interesting. You call it breath hold work meditation. Yeah. Most people, Irwin, I don't think would put the concept of holding one's breath and meditation together. I do. Yes. Precisely because you create that stress, which by the way, you create that stress and you are in charge of, you know, you are free to make it what you want, what you need to experience. It's not like a breath hold has to be a maximum breath hold all the time. In fact, most of the time, it's not even that. A breath hold practice, breath hold work practice, is very gentle, very progressive. It has to be enjoyable. It has to have a measure of stress so that you have to overcome, you have to practice the very uh, response that you, that you choose. It's like there's an mm. antidote for everything. Of course, you're going to become impatient. Well, perfect opportunity to practice patient. patience. Of course, you're going to doubt that you can. Well, perfect opportunity that you create to practice self-confidence. Of mm -hmm. course, all kind of uh, potential negative thoughts are going to arise. Well, perfect opportunity to clarify your mind, to make it, to feel positive and confident and patient, etc., etc., etc. So it's a practice of the mind. The mind practices itself. It does not just observe itself. Mm -hmm. It gets to practice practice itself. So that um, that bliss that you've experienced, that's really where the goal is. That's the, mm -hmm. the, it, and it's not always like that. Yeah. But when you do find that place, it is really beautiful. That is really what we expect from the concept of meditation. A place where we become free of concern. Mm. Time is suspended, timeless. There's no worry. Yeah. To not be worried, to not be concerned. How priceless is this? And what is it? What is a worry? What is a concern? What is an apprehension? What is it that we're always running our mind like really fast and about so many things and we have to organize mm. so much and anticipate so much in our minds and be so busy in our minds is because we need to regulate our whole world, our whole life. We have responsibilities, we have duties, mm. we have concerns, we have problems, we all do. But we're doing that all day. And it looks like there's no switch off. So we create a moment where we turn our intention inwardly. That's the idea be mm -hmm. behind any form of meditation. And there are plenty of forms of meditation. And they all have their own benefits. We do not pay attention to the world around us anymore. It's an interaction with self. We gift ourselves, ourselves with that moment to begin with. Mm. And then we start observing. Now, observing in the breathful work meditation, the mind observing itself is just like in any other meditation. That's the fundamental. 
But that's not enough. Why? Because the response to the perception of threat is inherently, by design, by default, it's all negative. It's panicky, it's uh, emotional, it's agitated physically, emotionally, and mentally. In everyone, and rather quickly, typically. So, beyond the observation, it's easy to quickly observe, okay, this is what's happening to my mind. Now, what do I want to, what do I want my mind to experience? That is the, the question. Mm-hmm. And that is then the intention and the choice is to establish despite all the physiological triggers that trigger our neurology to have that emotional response that turn into negative thinking, agitated thinking, agitated body, to intentionally, deliberately down-regulate all of that, tranquilize all of that, which means to find a sense of safety Mm. to reverse engineer that process, to find a sense of safety because when we feel safe, because we trust the experience, then we can relax. And that's when you are in that space within that you experience that. There's safety, trust. Trust. This is what life is about, really, you know. Yes. That's what the nervous system is about. This is where many of the modern illnesses lie, is when our nervous system is out of sync, when it doesn't feel safe, when we feel under threat. And as you say, we need to regulate. We will regulate in some way. We will take sugar, caffeine, booze, Coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms, whatever it might be. All it's trying to do is regulate your nervous system. Yes, because upregulation, that's not a skill. Except sometimes you're tired and you want to be alive. You're in a social yeah. environment. Like, I got to be present. I got to be funny or something or interesting. I got to be there. It can be just like that. Okay, you want to upregulate yourself. But in most cases, being agitated, starting with the mind, it's mostly the mind most of the time. It's yeah. in the mind. Even when the person looks like they are composed and tranquil, you have no idea what's running in their mind. And that can be a lot. And that can be overwhelming for a lot of people. And they are like, where is the switch off? Where is the switch off? So that agitation of the mind, that is not a skill because everybody somehow has it. There's also a lot of social, cultural pressure that pushes us to always be like that. Mm. To be able to find tranquility and not just to find it. Like, where is it? Where is it? Just to establish it. To yeah. make it happen. Now, that is the skill. That tranquilization, that downregulation, that is a skill. It's, that it's, needs to be practiced. It's arguably the most important skill in the 21st century that any of us need. Arguably, anyone who lives in civilized cu- culture. I even hate that word, civilized culture. It's, it's in some ways derogatory to... People who live more natural ways that actually yes. are more in sync with our biology, right? But let's yes. say, yes, I see. Do you know what I mean? But, but, but these, let's say, these modern, developed, yes. um, urban type lives that many of us lead, yeah. I think you can make a pretty good case that mastering the skill of down regulation is one of the most important skills to learn. And we can do that in a whole host of different ways. Having been a student on your course and experienced the benefits for myself, I want other people to experience it because I think there's something really powerful. If you can down-regulate when your body is screaming for you to breathe Mm -hmm. and get in your oxygen, I think you can down-regulate anywhere. Yes, exactly. In that primal moment where your body thinks something really bad is going to happen, I need to breathe. And that's what I think, if I was to summarize what I think the gold in that course is, there's there's many bits of gold, but for me, it's that that knowledge that if I can control my mind there, (laughs) I can control it anywhere. If the mind that you are can control itself, like, manage, yeah. intentionally fashion the experience 
that he wants to be in that moment, then yeah, it, that can apply anywhere. And what I've also found is that when I meditate, when I'm not doing the breath hold work meditation, because I also enjoy non breath hold related meditations. Yes. I have found that since I did your course, I'm able to access deeper meditative states much quicker yeah. because it's all on a continuum, right? It is. It's not separate yes. skill sets. It's, yes. it's, if you can do it at that extreme end, completely, you can quite easily do yes. it in a non-extreme end. Absolutely. And by the way, in breath will work, there's breath work, breath work, breath will work. I teach both. Yeah. It's, and by the way, you remember in the course, we only start to more substantially hold our breath in the second uh, week, not even like the, the first week, the first, first two sessions were mostly uh, explaining breathing, the physiology of breathing, uh, you know, some uh, very... Um, it was nasal breathing. It was yes. slowing the breath down. Yes. It was really gentle. Yes. And, and I think this is something that is worth making clear is that... This is not a method, a technique, a course to be macho that, hey, you know, I can hold my breath for four. I can do four no. and a half. I can do three. You're kind of missing the point. I get that's the way in for many people. It means, wow. It's the means to an end. You prepare your conscious mind. You prepare your, you work with your limbic brain. You work with like deeper aspects of your cognition. You work with your nervous system. And then, whoa, all of a sudden you become somehow, I like to use that word, timeless. Yeah. Detached from time and patient and tranquil in trust. And that magic happens. For someone who's interested yeah. or, uh, and they're thinking about maybe doing your online course, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they want to give it a go first themselves, right? Yes. Is there a simple practice that anyone listening to this podcast can actually experiment with themselves. Yes, actually on the on the breathholework.com uh, on the breathholework website we have a free initiation um it's a video and that that's one exercise because you know there are a variety of exercises there are diverse ways to hold your breath. Um it can be on full lungs, it can be with after an exhale, it can be um push to a certain degree. It can be a short recovery. It can be longer recovery. It can be, your whole, you know, there's, there are diverse ways, you know, to structure the time that you spend holding your breath. Uh, so that free initiation is one simple exercise, 10 minutes. And during these 10 minutes, um, you will breathe, uh, you will uh, breathe slowly you know, hold your breath. It's, 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 I'll let people just go there and discover the, the exercise. It's great to do, by the way, before you go to bed. I've uh, heard a lot yeah. of people fall asleep. Like, they're like, it's incredible. I realized after doing that, that exercise, I fell asleep like a baby. I slept like a baby yeah. the whole night. What's interesting about that for me is that when I spoke to James Nestor and Patrick McEwen, one of the things that was coming up was how, and I know you talk about this as well, online on your course that many of us are breathing too fast. Too fast. We take too many breaths. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we're breathing more through the mouth. You know, we should be breathing predominantly through the nose and we should be breathing uh, in a lot, a lot slower than we do. And we did this on the course, but what I found that I know you found with most of your students is without trying to actively slow down our breathing, by doing the practice, yes. by doing the breath hold work, your breathing rate naturally comes down. Yes. So we're talking about our respiratory rate. It's, yeah. uh, we're talking about how many breath cycles we take per minute at rest. So um, there's a simple way to uh, calculate that. Uh, one breath cycle is one inhale, one exhale. You start a timer. Um, you inhale, you exhale, one breath cycle. And without trying to change anything, we were trying to consciously change the way you naturally, spontaneously breathe. You count how many breath cycles you take in one minute. 
at the end of that course, with that breath holding practice, all the students notice, except those who already had a naturally low respiratory yeah. rate, but all those, and that could include young individuals fit that do, you know, they run, they're physically active and they have like 17 breath cycles per minute, 14, and then they're down to eight. Yeah. Or less. What should you have? So James Nestor uh, talks about that. He does? And, uh, yes, he does. Uh, and he says it's like 5.5. I remember. All right. That would mean, you know, uh, five full breath cycles and then either you have an extra inhale, an extra yeah. exhale at the end of it. I think that's a good number, uh, but I would say any anywhere below 10 is going to be good because it also depends on when you measure it. Is it in the morning right yeah. after you wake up or is it at the end of the day? depends on the state of your nervous system, on your metabolic rate. There are plenty of variables that can impact that. Mm. But, um, you know, uh, you lack sleep, you're stressed out, yeah. heart rate goes up. Because when you're stressed, heart rate goes up. You breathe faster. Um, anywhere below 10, well, personally, um, uh, at the altitude where I live, um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the U.S., it's uh, 2,000. 200 meters altitude, 7,000 plus feet elevation. In the morning, my uh, respiratory rate is around three. It can be five, around three. And that's uh, just relaxing, sitting like this and just yeah. breathing, breathing slowly. Yeah. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.